it's a huge component, as, and I, I, if you guys remember, I started out my session yesterday before I went on to the mission, that I'm a reformed life coach, okay? Uh, I spent, um, I want to say it was about six, six years or so, uh, developing and, and getting certified as a life coach by Jack Canfield, who's the author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, or co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul. Uh, and he was my mentor, ironically, Brandon, who's a partner of mine, he is actually, his mentor is Mark Victor Hansen, who's the other co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul. But um, uh, Jack also wrote the book, uh, uh, Success Thank You, Success Principles. And in the book, there's 67 success principles. Um, so I was certified on those 67 success principles and teaching people how to use those in their life and incorporate them. Uh, I learned those the first couple of years. I got certified in the process, and then I took those and I implemented them in my previous organization. So you heard Lloyd and I talking yesterday about the wireless company I worked for and the success that we had over an extended period of time. That was a direct correlation of me taking the top of the, not the top 20, but the key 20 that I felt were representative of the of business and implementing directly into my sales organization. So at the time, I initially had a few hundred employees, eventually grew my team, I, it was a, a 450 at my highest uh, scope of responsibility. Uh, but we, in, we introduced those success principles to the sales organization, the owners were uh, trusting enough to allow me to take what I felt was gonna be uh, beneficial by team and introduce those concepts. It took me about six months to begin to see the benefit of it. Uh, it took me about nine months before we really see it fully transition. But after nine months, my team was the number one sales organization for the number one dealer, for the number one carry in the nation for two and a half years. Uncontested. Many months we beat everybody by 20% or better. So now I'm going to tell you this because it wasn't my success as a sales leader. I don't even really believe it had a lot to do with what I was doing other than the fact that I stopped coaching sales. Okay, hear this again. I was a sales manager. I stopped coaching sales. When my boss, who was the chief operating officer, first heard that, he was a little concerned. <laughs> but I stopped coaching sales, and all I did was focus on developing my people. All I did was focus on teaching my people how to be better leaders. And the sales took care of themselves. I didn't focus on sales tactics. So as much success as I had in my career in being a top sales producer, I really don't believe that anything to do with my sales skills. Yes, I understood it. Yes, I understood the trials and tribulations of being a salesperson. I understood the mindset and all those other components. But at the end of the day, my success didn't have anything to do with my ability to drive sales results. It had everything to do with my belief in human beings and their ability to be a, become better human beings. And the more that I worked with the personal development coaching, that I introduced and taught them how to be better leaders, the better results we got. Month in and month out, I would beat my peers 10, 20, 30 percent over, not over quota, over the next person, next closest team to me. Matter of fact, one one particular month where I was actually on vacation with my wife for like two weeks, we were, I was not in the job for two full weeks of the month of August. My teams came in, uh, there was 18 teams in the, in the organization, I managed six of those teams at that time. My six teams came in one, two, three, four, five, six. And that was a very common occurrence. My daughter, who happens to be in attendance, she used to work for me at that time. One. <laughs> so I share that to give you some perspective. I don't believe that it's about sales, I believe it's about developing people. So when I joke about being a reformed life coach, I say that in jest because the reality is that I'm very passionate about it, but what I realized was, unfortunately, people have a hard time <laughs> paying money for personal development. But when you talk about their business and they realize how much money and time and energy they invested in their business, they're very quick to go ahead and say, yes, show me how to improve my business. I want to make more money. Consequently, I became a life, or business coach. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so I, I got some of this information I'm going to share with you. Uh, like I said, I, I kind of put a different twist to it, so bear with me a little bit here. But uh, I'm going to start with the six keys to managing your chaos. So I will also add that the vast majority of my career, I was what we would call a turnaround specialist. For 22 years, I don't think that I ever wasn't cleaning up somebody else's shit. Okay? If, you, if that offends you, sorry, but that's just the way it is. Okay? At the end of the day, most of my career was actually cleaning up somebody else's mistakes somebody else's market that they messed up, somebody else's challenges they created, I literally cleaned up everybody else's mess. And I got really good at it. 
So I know a little bit about managing chaos. I know a lot about dealing with other people's stuff. So as I move through this process, you kind of understand I have a pretty, static, or pretty standard uh, way of going through this, and that's why I'm very comfortable to share this in a way that you can implement this in your own businesses. First of all, what is chaos? Anybody? Feedback? Uh, thoughts? What's chaos in a business? Let me clarify a little bit better. Disjointed systems. Disjointed systems, sure. Putting out fires. Putting out fires, more specifically, probably, right? Out of control. Things are out of control, right? Unpredictable outcomes. Unpredictable outcomes, okay? That, that is everyday chaos in business, right? Say again? Hiring bots. <laughs> that, that can be definitely chaotic, okay? So the, um, when, when I say managing chaos, I mean, that, that is, in a sense, in my opinion, that is running a business, right? Because there's, in, if you're running a business, chances are every day is different. Every day is challenging. Every day is a new, new thing that you have to overcome. So when I talk about chaos, I am talking about the extreme circumstances. And the one thing that I've realized is whenever things are really, really crappy, when things are really, there's a lot of work to do, right? The first thing you have to do is put all the emotion aside. Which, if you don't know me that well, I'm actually really good at doing. Okay? Push all the emotion aside and think objectively about the target. Yes, I did learn that in the military, uh, but I, I came in honestly. My dad probably taught me that when I was about 14. Uh, I was single. My parents uh, divorced when I was seven, so from seven till about uh, 13 or 14, I think I was pretty much the number two person in the family, running everything, and you just learn how to just push through all the BS and get the crap done. So that's a skill set that I have to be pretty good at. So the first thing you need to do is clarify and identify your goals and what you need to accomplish. So you're looking at this big pile of mess, what do I need to fix? What's wrong, what's broken, what needs to be fixed? Second thing you do is determine and manage your resources. What do you have available to you to make these changes? Who are your people? What access to capital do you have, right? What, what other things can you do? What, what do you have currently right now that you can employ to fix the circumstances? Next thing you do is you're gonna create a timeline to resolve the outstanding challenges. One of the things I've recognized when turning things around is that things don't get turned around unless you define a timeline. Because if somebody says to you, yeah, it'll get fixed, don't worry about it, what, tend, what generally tends to happen? Nothing changes, I can tell you that much. Right, if there's no motivation to change it, it won't change. You have to implement a timeline, you have to go to your team and say, look, this is going to change, this is what we're gonna do, and this is when it's gonna be done by. When you do that, and I'm telling you from personal experience, when you go to somebody you say, this is when it's going to be done by, you may not hit that exact deadline, but I guarantee you you're going to be a lot closer to it. Next thing is you're going to effectively communicate your vision, your plan, and your timeline. We'll achieve these results using these resources in this timeline to achieve this specific outcome. That is the other thing you have to identify. Things may be bad. Things may not be where you want them to be. But you will not get where you want to go unless you clearly define where it is you want to go. So whatever the situation is, right, let's say, I'm going to pick on Ed for a second. He mentioned last night he has 119 agents. Okay? Out of 119 agents, he's learned the Pareto principle by default. About 80% of them don't produce, and only about 20% of his core people actually get the results. And I can tell him that I can help him improve that. I'm not telling that right now, but I will tell him that. Okay? <laughs> but I can help him improve that because what I know about the 80-20 principle is that you're always going to have the top 20%. If you know where to invest your time and energy, you can move the top 20%, and what that does is that brings the bottom 80% along. Now, there's a strategy to that, but the point is, is if you understand that, you know how to make that work. All key is setting the very clear expectations. These are the minimum expectations we'll have going forward. Right? And you have to set that and be assertive with that statement. So as we're managing through this, you have to be clear with them. This is what we're going to do by this time, and this is what it's going to look like when it's done. Now, not everybody will buy into it. Right? But if you clearly define it, you show them the plan, and you let them buy into the plan, you will get support. Number five, you're going to provide benchmarks and milestones. Okay? Again, setting BHAGs, right? If you turn around a market that's, that's been struggling for an extended period of time, uh, when I first got my first two new markets, when I asked for more responsibility, my boss, who was the chief operating officer, said, no problem. And the very next month, I got the two worst markets in the company, 15 and 16. 
And I was like, well, thank you very much. And I remember even telling my wife, I'm like, I think you did that just to piss me off. <laughs> but I took the worst two markets, and it was about 11 months later that we came in one through six. So, and they weren't five and six either. They were actually two and four. So the, the point is, these turnarounds don't take forever. You just know how to go about it. You have to know how to go about it. So I set the, expect, uh, set the benchmarks and the milestones. We will achieve this by this date. We will achieve this by this date. We will achieve this by this date. And just, just putting it out there, people are actually gravitating to it. Even if we didn't hit it, we were making movement towards, towards it. And the second thing is you're going to celebrate successes and acknowledge the delays and setbacks. Now I will tell you, the first part of my 10 year, the first 10 years of my 20 some odd year career in the wireless industry, I struggled with that first piece. I was raised by a single father who felt like nothing ever was good enough. And so it was challenging for me, like, because I never accepted enough. No, nothing was ever good enough. And it was a challenge for me because as much as that worked for me, as long as I had people who were just like me, achieving results, we would get results. But when I couldn't, when I couldn't, when my teams got big enough that I couldn't hire people just like me, then all of a sudden I started having challenges getting the results I wanted because I didn't recognize it then. So if you're familiar with the dis, dis, uh, dis, um, personality assessment, okay, a very high D, and the challenge that I had is a lot of salespeople are I's, uh, some are S's, uh, some are C's, but a lot of them are I's. And so as a D, as a dominant personality, an I who's an influencer, we're like a party goer. By the way, if you don't know my wife, she's very much an I, okay? So as a D, I'm like, get this done now, and the eye's like, yeah, I'll get it done when I'm ready to. <laughs> so as, a, as that kind of a sales manager, I struggled. When I got in tune with that, and I understood where that, what my, my gap was, and I made my adjustment to improve my, my leadership style, it changed everything. The more I did that, the more it helped me get into that mode of, I'm gonna celebrate these successes. We're gonna take time, we're gonna celebrate. Even if they're minor successes, we're gonna celebrate these successes. So again, when I get into these turnarounds, in the beginning, they were slower, they were harder. There was a lot of pushing uphill. But the more I figured out how to set those milestones and get people behind me, find these successes, all of a sudden things started building a lot faster. And I would go in and turn around markets in a few months, let alone six months, a year later. Recognize the goal has been achieved and determine a new level of expectation. That is the probably most important point that I had to learn the hard way. I went in and cleaned up markets, and then what would happen is we would get there, I would leave, hand off the market to somebody else, right? Because I didn't set this new expectation, right? I didn't do a good job of helping them understand, hey, look, what we accomplished, this was amazing. Now this is your new standard. We don't go below this anymore, ever. When I started doing that, lo and behold, the standards held, right? <clears throat> also improved my ability to demonstrate who the key, or to recognize who the key leaders were and when I made those handoffs to those particular individuals, we actually sustained success because I was able to give them a clear plan of action how to go about it. And then the last thing is, what's your new goal? So if anybody who's done any personal development, you will hear people talk about achieving goals, right? The worst thing that could ever happen in achieving a new goal, particularly a goal you've been at for a certain period of time, is that you achieve it. Why? Then you go to a lull. You go to a lull, exactly. Right, you spend all this time and energy for all this effort into achieving this goal, you achieve the goal, and then if you don't know any better, it's like, I've arrived. <sighs> and about six months you're like, why does everything suck right now? <laughs> you're not motivated, you're not pushing forward, you're not growing, you're not growing because you're regressing. Uh, if you know anything about moving forward, about, uh, about growth in general, and personal development, the main thing that we have to understand first and foremost more than anything else, if you're not moving forward, you're actually regressing. And think about it when it comes to like fitness. If you're not working out on a regular basis, how long does it take for your body to start breaking down? Days? You, <laughs> if you miss the gym, if you miss the gym for a few weeks, or Mr. CrossFit back here, <laughs> right? He's done a CrossFit gym. You miss the gym for a few weeks. How do you feel the first day back after the gym? Absolute trash. <laughs> <laughs> Your body starts breaking down almost immediately. Right? It's the same thing with personal growth. 
right? As soon as you stop moving forward, you start progressing. You start losing your edge. You start forgetting your good habits. You start letting them slip, and consequently, you start progressing and moving backwards. So the key is keep moving forward with your goals. And as you do that, what you do is you layer on top of that. And each time that you achieve a new goal, what happens? What happens to, your, your, to you internally? Self-esteem. Number one contributing factor to all sales success. Okay, winners win. Thank you. Lloyd's, Lloyd's favorite phrase in the whole world. <laughs> winners win, losers lose. Okay, right? but as you as you continue to have more successes, what happens is they compile on one another, and they build and they build and they build. It's just like a muscle <clears throat> building, right? The fibers tear and then they rebuild. They tear again and they rebuild. They tear again and they rebuild. Next thing you know, you're standing on stage, of Mr. Olympia. Okay? Not exactly like that, but you get the idea. <laughs> so those are the key six steps. Now I'm going to go into these in a little bit more detail. But I wanted to share this with you. This is a uh, sequence of leadership. I was taught this many eons ago. I couldn't even tell you many years ago. I'm going to say it was close to 20 years ago. So this is a sequence of leadership. It starts with leading. And the definition of leading, in my opinion, is inspiring others to accept and achieve goals. Right? So the important part about being a leader is not about telling people what to do. That's actually management. The important part about being a leader is inciting people, getting them excited and moving them forward, going after a common objective together. You have to inspire people and get them to accept your goal, your goal as a business, and show them how they're integral in achieving that goal and what they do is important to the organization. Next thing you need to be able to do effectively in leadership is to be able to communicate. You have to be able to convey your meaning and obtain understanding. So I can tell Gil something, and having worked with Gil for three and a half years now, I know that I have to make sure that I can <laughs> obtain the understanding, that he understood ex exactly what I was talking about. Right? We work really well together, we have lots of fun together, uh, but the, there are certain things that I understand inherently that Gil doesn't understand directly, and so I, I take the time to explain that to him, because that's not his experience, that's not his key focus. Does that make sense? Planning. Then now at this point, you begin to you set out what you're going to do. You've got everybody on your vision, your, your vision. You've shared what you're going to do. Now you have to put your plan together. Notice I didn't build the plan and then go tell everybody. No, I went and told everybody, and now I'm building the plan. You know why? Buy-in. Who said that? Buy-in. I want their buy-in before I go build the plan. Why? Because part of your planning involves what they are buying into. There you go. Very good. Thank you. John, right? <laughs> yes. Appreciate that, John. Absolutely. Part of my plan is recognizing what they don't believe is possible. So I'm going to build into my plan a strategy to overcome their objections before their objections. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> when we were talking about sales training. Okay, so we're strategically, we're going to work on our strategies, tactics, and action steps. So this is where I take my goal setting, we break it really down into the minutia. Get it down to literally, what am I going to do every day? In personal development, I used to coach your, your five things. These are the five things you do every day to move your goals forward. It's the same thing in business, right? Get it down to the very specific things. What do I need to do today? We're going to move from planning into organization. Okay, this is where you're going to optimize your work and resources to achieve your goals. I'm going to find out who's on my team. I'm going to recognize who the people are that I need to be working with closer. I'm going to find out who's better at certain things than I am and employ their services. Right? I'm going to recognize where we have gaps in the organization and where we have things that we need to work on. Uh, time management is a key component in anybody in a, for anybody in a leadership role, any organization but more specifically in a leadership role because you only have a certain amount of time. And you have to make sure that everybody else understands how important time is for you because that is the one commodity that we all can't get back. Right? You can make more money, you can't get time back. So then as we move from organization, now we go into resourcing, recruiting, selecting, developing, and retaining people. So when we're talking about moving from the, we've got the organization, now we're moving to resourcing, who do I not have? What people are not on my team that I need? 
to make these changes, to implement these changes, to, to do whatever it is, whatever task I'm going after, whatever responsibility I have. Who's not on my team? Who do I need more of? What resources do I need? Start finding those people and bringing those in. Is it, uh, is it a coach? Is it um, a sales specialist? Is it whatever it might be. Like find out who those people are and implement them. Now we'll move into implementing. You actually start putting the plan into place and execute on it. And then the big piece, and this is where a lot of people forget, traffic. Okay? When you're, particularly when you're in a turnaround scenario, if you're not tracking, literally daily, somebody asked me yesterday, he was sitting at that table, and I can't remember what his name was, but he asked me about tracking, or more specifically about, uh, it was when I did my sales presentation, but we literally set daily goals. Daily goals, because each day, if I'm off track, I can course correct daily. The biggest challenge that I had in the first half of my career, nobody ever taught us to track course correct daily. It was like, you have your goal, 30 days would pass, darn, I missed my goal. I'm going to go after it again. And that was how all of us managed. And the organization I was at, we came up with this idea. It's like, well, what if we checked in every day? Hell, what if we actually checked in every couple of hours? Is that a sense of micromanaging? Maybe. But not if I'm just reminding you what it is you committed to already. Then I'm just checking in with you. Now I'm coaching you. And so we employ that in my best coaches. Right? If I'm not checking in with you every week, there is a good chance you're probably not staying on course. When I make myself available to my clients, they can actually email me. Sometimes, two or three times a day, you can call me. But the point is that we want to make sure that we stay on track on a regular basis so we don't get off track. Because the longer you're off track, the much longer does it take to get back on track. We found that managing sales organizations the longer we went between having course corrections or conversations about performance, the harder it was to get somebody back on track when they were off. So much so that if you went more than 60 days without having a good conversation with somebody about performance, you typically have lost a good performer. That's how much of a detraction it can be in your organization. Now that's sales. That's something that you measure on a consistent basis almost every day. You guys remember earlier, Lloyd mentioned that we actually encourage people to try and incentivize everybody in the organization, regardless of their role. Even if they're in an operations role. We encourage people to have some sense of expectation, some kind of reward system, so they're constantly measuring their performance on a regular basis every day. In Gil's organization, you mind if I share, we created a, we created a team compensation plan. When I first came to the organization to work with him, one of the things I encouraged him to do was create a team compensation structure because everybody worked collectively. They didn't have a reward system, but they would have months where they'd really crush it, they have other months where it was not so good. But the one thing that started happening is when they got really close to the goal of making the commission payout, the, the team payout that they would get, uh, that you'd see that they're like, hey, we got this order, let's make sure we get it out before the end of the month. Let's, let's work really hard to get this sale. Hey, we've got that sale. He didn't get back to us yet. Let's follow back up with him because we only have three days left through the end of the month. These are people that were never motivated, but motivated by sales before then. Right? So it's, it's taking what you're working through, understanding what people are motivated by, and then tracking and measuring and redirecting accordingly. And then as you notice, it's a sequence, so it comes back. And again, we're setting new goals, challenging people in new ways, and recognizing what's necessary to keep moving things forward. Does that make sense to everybody? <clears throat> so let me step back for a second. So I told you I'm going to go through these six steps. I wanted to introduce this concept because this is the key components that we incorporate into the strategy. This is my book, Success with Goals. I'm actually in the process of rewriting this book. I'm going to rewrite it for Success with Goals for Business Owners. And uh, I'm trying to come up with a catchy phrase. Actually, Brandon's usually good at that stuff, and we all employ the services for that. But, um, this is my 10 steps. There's actually step zero for the, in, the, in the personal development space. I call that uh, deciding what your passion is. In the uh, business space, it's determine your vision. What do you want your business to look like five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now? Most people that get in business don't do that. They think about today, they think about what I, want to, what I need to do to bring in revenue, but they're not looking 10, 15 years down the road, what's my business going to look like? So as you heard Lloyd mention earlier, start with the end in mind, right? The reason that 80% of businesses never sell is because the owner developed the business in a way that they're never going to be able to sell it. They didn't build it in 
in a way that can transition to somebody else. You heard me, I mentioned yesterday morning about the number of, percent, the number of business owners that build their business, the baby boomers that are all retiring right now. They're not going to transition their businesses. And most of them figured, I'm just going to have my son or my daughter take over. You know what the problem with that is, right? They don't want to. They don't want to. <laughs> And it's not, a, it's, not, it's not a knock on anybody. It's like, you know what, hey, my, my dad, when I was young, my dad had a uh, uh, chip route. He had a wise potato chips. Probably not familiar with it here. It's mostly back east. He had a chip route. He drove around all the different grocery stores and convenience stores in a certain territory. And every Saturday, because we had babysitters back then, uh, I would ride on the route with him. And, he, and, and the, here was the deal. The reward was he would play catch with me when we got done. Now, mind you, we would start at 6 in the morning and usually didn't get done until 6 at night. So guess what didn't happen for me? <laughs> we didn't play catch. <laughs> but I did spend the entire day with my dad, which was well worth it for me. Right? And I learned, I learned a ton of great things about how to be, about work ethic and how to be a good, a good owner, employer of my business. But most importantly, I developed a passion. One thing that my dad taught me that really resonated with me was understanding what I can do and how I can make it better. Everything my dad, every motion my dad took, every, every, every turn that he made, there was a thought behind it. He didn't do anything without having strategy behind it. If he made, if he made a right-hand turn, it's because that right-hand turn was going to get him to his destination faster. And he ingrained that in my head, so much so that fast forward a few years later, probably 10 years later, I'm working at a steel mill factory, and I'm asking questions like, Hey, why do we do it like this? And they're like, just shut up, kid, just do your job. I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't make sense. We're doing this. This is going to spill and fall on somebody. Don't worry about it. It's okay. We got ocean. You know what? I couldn't do anything without asking questions because I didn't understand why it worked the way that it did. And when it didn't make sense to me, everybody got frustrated because I just keep asking questions until I understood what it made sense. And then I would offer my advice, and most people didn't want to hear it yet. So now people actually want to hear me, but then they didn't like it. Anyway, so we start out with a vision, right? And so my point was with the vision is you put it out there, you make it very clear about where you're going, where you want to go, and then you share that with everybody, right? That was that sequence of leadership. Define your goals, then you refine your goals, you prioritize. The one thing that I have to remind everybody of, you only can have one real goal in your business at any given time. If you have two or three goals, you might be able to get with a secondary or tertiary goal, but that's it. If you have more than one primary focus in your business, you will not achieve it. Plain and simple. Having one strategic goal will ensure that the odds of you achieving that goal are about 90%. Regardless of how big the goal is, assuming you give it the appropriate amount of time to achieve it. But if you don't do that, and you have multiple goals, it, you will fail. Guaranteed. You're diverting resources to other places, other attention, and you're going to fall short where you want to be. So always have a number one breakthrough goal, whatever that is. It's the highest priority with the biggest value return. Create a list of things to do, right? Begin with the end in mind. Recognize and document challenges and obstacles. That's another big piece that business owners forget to do, particularly newer business owners. Invest the time and energy to recognize and document the challenges and obstacles that you already know you're going to run into. You are going to have challenges. You're starting a business. You haven't done that before. You haven't done this business before. Whatever it is, you're going to recognize this. Document that. Record that. And build a strategy on how to improve it. Fix it in your mind now. Two reasons. One, it gives you a plan, right? And more importantly, two, you know what the biggest setback is for anybody on any course achieving any goal? It's an obstacle they didn't see coming. You get hit with it, and now you're like, oh my god, what am I going to do? And then you stop. You've lost momentum, and now you start progressing. If you recognize what the obstacles are, and guess what happens in addition to that? Uh, Lloyd reminded me the other day, I used to use it in my, uh, on my goal setting workshops. Plane takes off from LA, flies to New York direct. What percentage of time is that plane off course? for the 3,800 mile flight that it goes. What percentage of time is playing off course? Cheater. 98%. <laughs> the plane is off, now you should know this, you're a pilot. 98% <laughs> of the time the plane is off course. 
Because bless you. If you don't have the right players on your team, who do you need to find? Right? That's probably, uh, we, we prescribe the concept of strengths based leadership. For, uh, I'm trying to remember the author of that. But um, it's called Strengths Finders in the book. Using that, that in, what they do is they teach you how to fill your team in with people that complement your strengths. Or complement with their own strengths, right? So my strengths may be this particular thing, like for it. Uh, I'm really good with analytically, finance, things like that. So I bring in people from other categories that help me round out my team, particularly my core team. And then what? What resources do we need? What capital do we have to allocate? Or what can we allocate? Uh, and what do we still need? So we go out and recruit that as part of my assessment process. Create your timeline to resolve outstanding challenges, right? So I, yeah, again, I cannot reinforce how important it is. When I first started turning over markets, it took forever. It was so long. It was so much frustration. It was so many beating, beating my head against the wall. As soon as I started developing a timeline and just saying, we're going to do this in six months. And I had people look at me like, okay, Eric, you sure? And ironically, right around five, six months, we seem to have hit our goal. I don't know how that happened. I'm like, well, shit. I wonder if I can do it in four months. Would you be surprised? It only took four months. Right? So set the timeline and lay it out there. Um, I'm going to screw this one up. It's been a while since I did this. Um, there's a... Uh, your your job, you, you, if you're given a defined timeline to, to accomplish a job in a certain amount of time, could be eight hours, ten hours, twelve hours, whatever it is, you will your time, your effort will expand or contract to get the job done within the timeline outline. And like I said, over the years, I start I started proving to myself that we can get this done faster and faster and faster. I just need to determine what it is. As long as I've got a good plan and I've got the right resources in place, we can get things done whenever we want to. Effective time management. Uh, determine your time, what your time is worth. This is super important. A lot of people forget this. Uh, expect it, um, take your expected compensation divided by 2,000. That's 2,000 hours. Uh, and then you get your time, your, what, your, what your time is worth. Okay? This helps you in determining what you should be delegating. So, have a lawyer. A lawyer probably makes about 500 bucks an hour, billable hours. That's, their, that's their, what they do. We're going through the exercise, and I said to him, okay, so you make 500 bucks an hour, right? So what do you really want to be making? Well, I want to be making 1000 bucks an hour. Okay. So we went through the exercise. We figured it all out. Okay, what do we do with 1000 bucks an hour? So I see him. We're having a conversation. I see him. He's got an Excel spreadsheet out. He's going through a list of clients, and he's doing some kind of follow-up with them. I said, just out of curiosity, what do you, how much do you think you could pay somebody to do that? I don't know, 15 bucks an hour? <laughs> Why the hell are you doing that if your time is worth a thousand bucks an hour? It completely changed his perspective. Right? And, and it, it wasn't it wasn't like you're too good for that. It was simply, as a lawyer, you're the only one that can have that conversation with a client that's gonna get them to decide whether they want to work with you or not. So why in the world would you be doing something that doesn't give you that thousand dollars an hour? You know how many business owners fall prey to this every day, all the time? Like reading emails. <laughs> says the guy who outsources all his email reading to his assistant <laughs> okay huge huge piece right so in any kind of task assignment you can now assign your tasks accordingly to the people that are suited for those roles right uh, ROI employ the Pareto principle so when I say Pareto principle you guys have all heard the 80-20 principle if you haven't heard Pareto principle uh, I'm going to use and pick up my wife for, instance, for a moment here uh, 2011 12 she just you know, she went from mortgage into uh, mortgage to title uh, as a marketing rep for a title company. She went into home warranty because if you guys remember, two thousand eight and nine wasn't very good in the real estate industry, and uh, so she went into home warranty for a period of time for a handful of years. She's frustrated because she's getting pushed back. She's sitting here with this list of a thousand real estate agents. A thousand. Real estate. She's like, I'm supposed to be going after these people. So I said to her, I said, okay, well, uh, you know, obviously. 80, 20, let's look at the top 200 people. Plus she's going through a list, and like, they already do business with so-and-so, they're not going to talk to me, blah, 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 she's going through it. It's like, maybe one here, maybe one here. And I just said to her, I said, well, just out of curiosity, now remember, this is 2011, 12, 13. Who's actually buying houses right now? Because there are not a lot of people buying houses. You guys remember the mortgage industry changed, right? They were rewriting the laws that made it super hard for people to qualify. Nobody's buying homes. I said, who's buying homes right now? Investors. Could you get an investor? She's like, 
well, I don't know. It's, the compensation is probably going to be different. Can you find an investor buying 100 homes a month? That's exactly what she did. She found one, I think she eventually had two or three investors who were buying multiple homes, many, many homes. And one specifically was well over 100, 100 homes a month. And at the, at the peak of her productivity in the home warranty industry, at the time she was in it, she was on a team of 17 people over I don't know, seven or eight states or whatever it was. And the 17 people, there are 17 people who were on her team. She was representing 40% of all the production of those 17 people. She figured out where the vein was, put all her time and energy into that group of people, went after that group of people, and got all the results. So, 80 20 principle. Employ that and put it, it's huge. <clears throat> How to get the most effective and quickest results, right? Prioritize your activities using the Eisenhower. I, I, sorry. Prioritize your activities using the Eisenhower matrix. I'm going to ask: Has anybody ever heard of that before? Really? Yeah. Okay. So the Eisenhower matrix is actually um, who was uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, used the uh, the phrase. Um, uh, now I'm going to screw up the phrase, but he basically said, uh, I, 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 all, um, "I have problems. All my." All my problems are important, but they're never urgent. I'm, I'm, I'm completely botching it right now. But basically, what he did is he formulated the concept of the matrix, uh, which you all have heard from, from Stephen Covey, which he calls the, uh, um, he uses it to determine what, where you should spend your time. And, but the Eisenhower matrix basically is a break it down and helps you understand what's urgent and what's important. Right? So if you know what's important in your business, some things are important and some things are urgent. But just because it's urgent doesn't mean it's important, right? What we find is most people spend the vast majority of their time doing urgent tasks and activities when they should spend their time doing the important but not urgent, which is usually the most productive and most valuable time spent, right? When you spend your time doing things that are important but not necessarily urgent, that's actually the one where you get the biggest bite for your buck. That would be like... Reading, which most people don't take the time to do. That would be like doing uh, uh, investment strategy and understanding what you need to do differently, right? It would be taking the time to do the thing that most people won't take the time to do. That's where you get your biggest return. So we teach people how to do that. And then determine your plan and review your plan daily. Uh, review the plan daily for progress and communi communicate that progress. That's another big thing. What I find uh, in, in many organizations, not just owners I work with, but even in bigger organizations where I worked in the past, they didn't share their progress. One of the biggest contributing factors of success we had at Express Locations was the fact that we shared where we stood every day at all times. Every dollar. Right? And people were like, oh, they're going to see how much money you make. Didn't matter. You know how much goodwill we got by sharing all of that data? People were bought in. People were sold on the organization. The culture was phenomenal. A lot of it had to do with the fact that we built the culture from the beginning when we helped people understand, hey, you were a steward of this business. You're, it's like your own business. We want you to run it that way. And we entrusted people to do so. The more straightforward we were with the information, the more buy-in we had. A little, few more pieces here on uh, um, effective time management delegated appropriately. I kind of mentioned that earlier. But more specifically, understand that it's art not a science, or art and a science, sorry. Um, you need to plan for it. And the biggest reason, the biggest reason push I get, pushback I get why people have delegate is like, well, I can't trust them, they're going to do it wrong. I hear that all the time. You're absolutely right, they're going to do it wrong until they learn how to do it right. And you have to allow them to have that space, because if they don't, they're not going to learn. That's what learning is. Learning is, what is it, Brandon? It's not failing forward. Somebody came up with something yesterday. Falling forward. Falling forward. Falling forward, thank Falling forward. you. Falling forward. Right? Learning is falling forward. Is that Robin? <laughs> right? Learning is falling forward, right? We're, we're, you're, going to, you're going to have setbacks. But for you, for your organization to grow and learn, you have to allow them to make those mistakes. What you do to buffer that is you give them small responsibilities initially, and you grow on it. Just like my dad did on that freaking potato chip route. You know, first couple times he had me carry a whole bunch of bags of chips and I dropped them and stabbed them all and ruined half his inventory. He's like, okay, I'm not going to give him that much next time. <laughs> right? You have to allow them to learn and grow from that. 
And then the last one is preemptively address obstacles. Again, I can't say that enough. Directly recognize obstacles and challenges. Share openly, hey, this is not going to be easy, Ed. This is going to be a tough challenge for us. But I know we can do it. And here's why. And here's our strategy of how to overcome these challenges that we already know we're going to face, that we're going to face. When you do that, it absolves the issue. It's no longer a bitch session. This is what we're going to do, and this is how it's going to get easy. And we're going to get through it by doing this. Most people are so afraid to address the problem that's in front of them that they avoid it. All it does is create problems later on down the road. Right? So communicate openly, acknowledge progress and setbacks, and address accordingly. Uh, effectively communicate your, your vision, confidently and clearly communicate your vision and expectations for your end goal. Again, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, openly acknowledge challenges and opportunities, share your plan to overcome these, and then get buy-in. Right? So what I found, again, I, I tell people where we're going, then I create the plan, then we go out and we introduce the plan and we, we start executing on it. Ensure your message conveys these key points, like I said earlier, we'll achieve these results, using these resources in this timeline to achieve this specific outcome. Provide benchmarks and milestones. As I mentioned earlier, determine what looks right. What, I'm sorry, determine to them what right looks like. Okay, another thing that I see done wrong in many larger organizations particularly, everybody says, this is your job. But nobody says, this is what it looks like when you do the job the way you're supposed to. Take the time to help them understand what it should look like when it's done correctly, and people will at least now understand, okay, this is where I'm going. This is what it should look like when I do it right. If you don't take the time to explain that, you can tell me my job, but then you're leaving to my interpretation of what that looks like. But if you show me what right looks like, Lloyd mentioned earlier, right? We, we actually, um, I think we spoke about it yesterday. You take the top performers, you find out what they do, that makes them good at what they do. And then you go, actually, you were talking about that last night. Take the top performers, recognize what they do well, and then go find more people like that. Right? That's how you scale up an organization to find more of the right people, but you show them what right looks like. Uh, one of the first things I did with my daughter when she came into the wireless industry, I took one of our top performing younger ladies who worked for the organization, she was a pretty good salesperson, and I had my daughter shadow her for the first two or three months she was in the business. I would say shortly after the first three months, she was probably as good, if not better, than the young lady she was learning from. I hear. <laughs> <laughs> but I specifically put her with that, that young lady because one, I, loved, I knew they were going to connect well, and two, I wanted her to learn those sales tactics. I wanted her to learn the things that she was doing right, that she was getting those results. So clearly identify and provide insight to what success looks like. Determine what's unacceptable. That's another thing. What's unacceptable? If this is what right looks like, what's, what's the boundary I can't cross? And clearly identify that so there's no misconstruction or mis a misunderstanding. Determine and communicate rewards for success. When you do this, this is your reward. This is what it looks like. This is how you'd be compensated, whatever that is. And then lastly, clearly identify what the wrong looks like. If you don't do this, you don't have a job here anymore. Now, the best part about that is, and it sounds kind of harsh, and this is probably 20 some odd years of managing salespeople, the value of clearly identifying when you don't do this right, this is what it looks like. <laughs> I didn't have to do that conversation. People self selected out. I, I, I would tell you that I probably didn't fire anybody the last. Seven or eight years I was doing that. Not a single soul. Not because I had other people to do it, because I didn't have to. People would get in, they start doing the job, they're like, ooh, I'm not going to be successful at this, I'm out. You had all the resources, we had all the training, everybody had the same resources and training. The reality was, we probably had a phone call on the culture fit, but they would get in, they realized they're not willing to work that hard, and they'd opt out. Because they were clearly understood what wrong looked like. And let me tell you, for anybody who's managed people, right, any people, let alone salespeople, if you do a really good job at that, it takes away all the burden of being the boss. Because it makes it so much easier to do your job when everybody knows what they need to do and you don't have to constantly micromanage everything they do. 
Last couple slides, uh, take constant and continued action. Review progress daily, report, communicate regularly. That's, you know, like I said, you cannot not communicate enough. Celebrate successes, acknowledge the delays and setbacks, and then determine potential course corrections and address accordingly. That, like I said, that, that, that we, whether you're tracking sales, you're tracking activity and performance, whatever it is, if you're looking at it, you should be communicating it. Right? I, that we, I can't tell you. <laughs> um, we had numerous times where people would come into our organization uh, and they're like, they would see their name in the stack ranking. And we, we color coded the stack ranking based on performance. So if anybody's familiar with that at all, the green is good, yellow is not so good, red is definitely not good, right? And people would be offended by that. I'm like, then change it. <laughs> Suck it up, buttercup. Sorry. <laughs> right? It's not that, uh, like, you're getting the training, you're getting the resources, you have access to everything you need to be successful. You either put it up or you're not putting it up. I mean, I was not the best salesperson. I was pretty good, but I was not the best by far. Right? There were a lot of people better than me. What I was able to do was duplicate, create a duplicatable process that I could introduce to many people and have them find just as much, if not more success than I did. But what I never did, and I never had a problem with, was managing people who could get results. Because I just said, hey, this is what it is. Here it is, black and white. You're either doing it or you're not doing it. And there's no hard conversation or any of that fun stuff. It's just like, look, you're getting it done or you're not getting it done. And if you're okay with that, well, we're not. <laughs> so now I don't have to have that conversation. Then lastly, um, when you recognize success, make sure you communicate the goal has been achieved. Right? When you're, when you're hitting the number, go out of your way to recognize your team for achieving the goals. And this is one, as I said earlier, I struggled with this, right? One, I struggled to acknowledge any success, but more importantly, I did not do a really good job of going out of my way to acknowledge success, even, even the small wins. The more I did that, the more I got back. The more people appreciated my leadership, the more people came to me. As a matter of fact, early, early on, I've had people reach out to me 10 years later, and you can even look at my LinkedIn profile as a gentleman that worked for me back in Seattle in the early 2000s. And he's like, I can't tell you how hard Eric was on me, but I can't tell you how much I appreciate it now because I learned so much of working with him. And it really kind of came down to the fact that that was before I learned how to celebrate successes. I can't imagine how much further he'd be had I known that then. Right? Determine you have reached your, your new level of expectation, so clearly identify we have achieved this new expectation. Now this is the new standard. It's not the benchmark we're going after. This is the new standard, and we don't go below this standard. Right? I see so many people miss that opportunity. We've achieved a new standard, right? We're achieving this goal. Let's say, let's say, let's say our, our, our sales goals were 200,000 a month, and all of a sudden we go from two to three, and then three to four. If you went from two to four, that would be unreasonable to assume that's a new standard. But if you progressively went from two to 250 to three to four to five, there's no reason why you don't say, okay, well, now the benchmark is four. We've definitely proved we can do that because we broke through it already. So the benchmark is four, and then we're going to set the goal at six. Does that make sense? So we are talking about earlier about setting achievable goals, right? We've already touched or at least brushed that number. Let's stretch it. Let's add 20%. That, that'll, be our, that'll be our stretch goal. Our BHA, maybe the BHA is still a million, right? But we'll, that'll be our stretch goal. But that, that standard, right, we're not going to fall below 400,000. That's the logic I would use when I'm setting my goals. And then the last one is move on to the next goal. Right? We're here, we're going here now. And sometimes that may not be top line performance, it might be ancillary sales. That's another missed opportunity for business owners. They get into a certain point where they're, they're focused on driving top line sales results. And, and, I, and I, I remind them, I'm like, okay, so we're getting results here, we're making progress here, but look at all these other ancillary opportunities that we're missing out on. We could be bringing this as a revenue stream. We could be bringing this as a revenue stream. And that aggregate would move us up 10, 20% just because the top line is already where it's at. But we're missing the opportunity to bring those incremental, incremental sales in. All right, so that's my presentation. Anybody have any questions? Yes? Yeah, the, the last part you were saying, you know, as far as like ancillary things that mm -hmm. uh, you may bring in to raise the. Uh, the performance or the results. Yes, sir. Um, do you set that up as part of the system to identify those? Like, how, how does that work? Yes, it, you weren't here yesterday. So, yeah. So, one of the things that we absolutely do is we recognize uh, part of part of what we do. Uh, 
with my biz coaches, we have a software application that we utilize and we bring in key components to your business. So we sit down and we go through and we analyze your business. As a sales manager, if you're asking that more directly, when I was as I was doing that, well, we recognized what the um, what we would do is we'd look at what other companies were doing, carriers for instance, what their attachment rates are or different categories of business. We would look at that and say, okay, well, if they're able to get that, we believe that we can get this, right? Uh, so my first logic when we, we first started doing incremental sales, let's say accessory sales or something like that, we would look at it and say, okay, well, uh, McDonald's gets a 10% attachment rate just by asking, right? So if we could simply ask, we should expect at least a 10% attachment rate. Uh, and generally speaking, whether it was insurance or financial services or some other component like that, what we typically find is just by asking, there's a 10% attachment rate, 15% attachment rate in general. And then with a little bit of salesmanship, you can increase that to 25 to 30%. And so we pick a number somewhere in that threshold that we feel is an appropriate number. We in, in, incrementally, in, incrementally incorporate that into the, minute of the uh, sales number tracking, and we incorporate that with a separate attachment rates and then an aggregate revenue. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Okay, excellent. Anyone else? Yeah, like, just a couple comments. Um, also, you know, looking at what others in the industry that you're in, what they're doing, top performers, um, that's another way to identify categories uh, of opportunity. So literally there would be people, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but within, in our wireless days, there were people that were not selling accessories. And it's like, are you out of your mind? Accessories represents 20, 30% of your profits. You've got to add that onto your business. And it's by looking at what the top performers are doing that you're able to identify additional sources of revenue. So that's kind of piggybacking off of that. Yeah. Um, and then also just wondered about, um, uh, at some point you want to become the benchmark. In other words, you, you're the top dog. You're, so now at that point, um, it's a little bit more difficult to determine what, um, it, what you're able to do, what's possible, because you're the one leading the path. Yeah. 